is the day that the Lord has made. We're rejoicing. We're glad in it. Thank you for joining us today. Wherever you are in the world, I give a shout out to people in other countries, to other states here in the United States, to the military, to college students, to families about to go to church. God bless you. Thank you for joining us wherever you are. It's a joy to be able to come to you every week. I'm ministering today on this Our Family Life Ministries Day. We are honoring the ministries in our church that strengthen families and I hope you know that we live in a world that we're facing a crisis in the family and there's every effort in the world to try to destroy the family and I want to talk today about that devastating destruction that's happening to the family by demons that have aimed their guns as a matter of fact I want to talk about those demons that are devastating and dividing families Malachi chapter 2 talks about it grab your Bible. I believe it's a word of God for our nation. Thank you for joining us. Be blessed. Hallelujah. Father, we honor you. We worship you. We adore you. And we humble ourselves before you, Lord. We acknowledge that you are God all by yourself. There's not another. You have all power and might in your hands. And we give you the glory, the honor, and the thanks for your loving kindness to us. And the multitude of your mercies. We pray that you would just, as we intercede for the persons whose hand we hold, we pray. We intercede for them now in Jesus' name. We pray for miracles and breakthroughs in their life. We pray for our brothers and sisters through the internet and around the world that join us though not here physically but God we pray that you would touch their lives whatever they stand in the need of I pray that you would save somebody that needs salvation reclaim a backslider Lord give assurance to the person with the doubts in one way or the other they get saved or get assurance of their salvation plant the people who are believers edify your saints let them be strengthened let somebody's heart be changed somebody's mind be changed somebody's decisions be changed that they might walk in the scent of your will. Father, put a hedge around this place, bind every distracting and demonic spirit, and we welcome the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to do whatever he chooses to do. Anoint us to be your mouthpiece for your glory and honor, and we give you the thanks ahead of time. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. All right, you can be seated. Grab your Bibles and open it up to Malachi chapter 2. I'm going to give you my message ahead of time. I don't have points like I normally do, um, but you can write down whatever God says to you while we're sharing today. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to have my points on the, on the screen like I normally have them, but I want you to write down what God says to you. I'm titling this message, The Devastating Demons That Destroys Families. The devastating demons that destroy families. That's what I want to talk about. There is, there is an all-out attack against families and against marriage and against the home, the institution of home. <clears throat> the, the, the enemy, the devil, has unleashed all of his attacks, all of his um, weapons against the institution of family, of the family and of marriage. And... And I want to talk about it today. This is Family Life Day, and God has a heart for families. Did y'all know that? And I, I want to talk from this, this last book, this book of Malachi. It's the last book of the Old Testament. If you don't know the Bible, just go to the table of contents. Uh, it's the last book of the Old Testament. And, and, and just for, by way of, of uh, background, this is, the, this is the last book that's in the Bible before there will be 400 years of silence from God before Jesus comes on the scene. It becomes pertinent to understand what did God say before he decided he wasn't going to say nothing? Because it's going to be 400 years before anybody else shows up on the scene. It is through the prophet Malachi that he talks to the children of Israel. And those verses, I'm going to be preaching from verses 11 through 17, but I want to start off with something that's startling to me, amazed me, shocked me when I read it, as a matter of fact. It's verse 17. Because in chapter 2, verse 17, it says, you have wearied the Lord. Now, I talk to a lot of people who get wearied and tired and worn out 
but I never thought you could weary God. Isn't that, isn't, that, isn't that an amazing thing to think that God could actually get tired? As a matter of fact, that word weary means to be worn out and sick. That's what it means. That's what the word means. And then the text says, you weary God. It says, you wearied him with your words, it says. Yet you say, in what way have we wearied him? Now, part of, a part of, let me back up for a minute, because a part of what I do every day is I talk to people who get tired of life, get tired of marriage, get tired of their job, get tired of relationships, get tired of paying bills, get tired of going to church, get tired of being in ministry. I deal with that every day. And what I try to tell people, don't be weary in well-doing. That's a, there's, there's a word that God has for people who get wearied, and that's it. Galatians 6 9. Do not be weary in well doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. Ooh, that's powerful. That God says, I got your back, I got you covered, and if you hang in there, if you don't quit, He says, in due season you shall reap if you don't faint. Wow, that's a profound promise. It's powerful. It's a promise from God. That, that's exactly what he'll do. I believe that promise from God. That, that's a promise from God to us. But what about when God gets weary and tired? I mean, that was a strange concept to me to think that God could even get tired. That God could even get weary. And so I had to ask asked myself by reading, I read further to find out what he got, what, what made him get wearied and tired. And it tells us right here, he says, you wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say in what way have we wearied you, verse 17. In, what, in, in that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Did y'all get that? Y'all miss it. Went right over your head. Let me bring it back, bring it back to you. Here's what worry God, worries God when when you say that the people who are doing bad are doing good when you call evil good it wears out god and you say he's delighting in people who are doing that it wears him out god gets tired and, and, and matter of fact that's our culture we're calling wrong right and right wrong Thanks, thank all 17 of y'all for that rousing affirmation, but it's, it's a profound thing. Not only, not only that, but, but it's not just what you say. When we start going back to verse 11, it's also what we do that wears out God. Verse 11, look, look at verse 11. Let's read this for a moment. I promise y'all I'll be finished when I get done. Verse 11. <laughs> Judah has dealt treacherously and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem for, listen to this, for Judah has profaned the Lord's holy institution which he loves. He has married the daughter of a foreign God. Ooh, that's y'all missed a great spot to say amen. Here's, here's what it says, that the people of God, the chosen people of God, that for today, that's you and I, we're in that crowd, we have profaned God's holy institution. We have brought shame to it. We have profaned it. It's a holy institution that God loves. And what are the institutions that God loves? Uh, there, there, there are just a couple of institutions, and one of them is the institution of marriage. Matter of fact, he goes on and says, here's what, here's what they did. They've married the, they, he has married the daughter of a foreign god. Now, I don't expect to get a lot of amens today. I don't expect a lot of people to bring any money up here and drop it on the altar. I don't expect nobody to shout and dance, run around the building today. But this is an important word that I have to tell you about. It is, it is the challenge and the problem that people have treated marriage in a horrible way. We have, we have looked at marriage and treated it as though it's a, it's a car. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you married a person that... that that, that, that has all the stuff you like. Fat tires. Convertible that flips back. 
the sound system that you like. And so that's the car you want. They got all of that. You like that. And then you, you, you cherish it. You ride around town, lean, diamond in the back, sunroof top. You young people don't know nothing about that. That song right there. Leaning with a gangster lean. I see we got some old people in the building here. But the same car that you once found great joy in gets a few scratches in it. The convertible don't go back like it used to go back. Gets a few dump, dent, dents and bruises. And now you want to trade it in and get you a newer model. I thought y'all would get that. I thought the 12 o'clock crowd would get it. The 10 o'clock, I didn't have to explain it at 10. I got to explain it to you. The, the fat tires is the big butt and the big breast. The convertible is she was flashing you when, you when you first met her. The sound system is she was whispering all those things to you in your ears that you wanted to hear. Go ahead, Pastor. I'm preaching better than y'all are saying amen. And you liked it, it. But now she got some age on her. Now she can't back it up like she used to back it up. Now you're tired of it. And we've treated the institution of marriage like a car. When it's not a car, it is a sacred institution of a holy God. It's a sacred institution and we've treated it poorly and badly. And, and the text here, it says, the problem here is, she, he says, he, he, he married the daughter of a foreign god. That word foreign means strange. They got connected to a stranger, somebody who didn't even know God. No relationship with the true God. Because you thought, you, you married him or her because you thought you could help evangelize them. They didn't go to church when you was courting and dating, but you, you, you think you can get them in church. They showed no evidence of a walk with God. And even though the scriptures told you not to do it, you went on and got married. You treated this sacred institution and made it an abomination. As a matter of fact, verse 12 says, may the Lord, verse 12, may the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob the man who does this. The man who does this, being awake and aware. Can I talk about that for a minute? Being awake and aware. See, some of you have been a part of this church long enough that you are awake and aware. You've heard the teaching, you've read the scriptures, you know the word, but you push right on past what the word says and do what it is you want to do. You are awake and aware. Now you done got married and went on and married that joker, went on and got married, now you're having hell, now life is miserable, now you want to meet with the pastor. And this is what I do every day. It is what my phone calls are. 90% of my phone calls are people who are in marital problems and they need help. They got drama, they got pain, and they want me to, they want me to adjust my schedule, adjust my time, and meet with them when I done taught them from the pulpit and taught them in classes and made classes available. But you disregarded it and did what you wanted to do.
And here's my thoughts. Let me be honest with y'all. Let me confess. If you don't listen to me from what I say up here in the pulpit, you ain't gonna listen to me when you sit in my office and my seat in my office. Lean over to your neighbor and say, he preaching better than you're saying amen. <laughs> we try to teach you that this is the most important and sacred decision you'll make is who you get married to. That's a very important sacred decision. It's not something you decide on the, uh, 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 a whiff of the moment. You don't just decide today we're going to go down to the justice of the peace and get married. No, 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 no. Hell no. no. I'm sorry that slipped out for just a moment. You get premarital counseling, you go through the classes, you get, you understand the principles of what to look for and what not to look for. You, 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 you get prepared. Because it is a big deal. The most important decision in your life is who you marry. A lot of you don't listen. Do what you want to do. That's why you've been married two, three, four times. Can I just say, can I say something while I'm on this thing? If you've been married more than twice, the problem can't be, all the problem can't be just with all the other people. At a minimum, you have a decision-making problem, a judgment problem. At a minimum, why you keep picking out the wrong jokers? Getting kind of quiet in here, isn't it? I want to talk to the single people. First of all, I want to challenge and I want to warn the single people that you make sure you hear from God before you get married to somebody. Get a word from God. However God talks to you, communicates to you, however God speaks to you, however he lets you know he's around, he loves you, he's got direction. However God talks to you, get a word from God. It's critical. So you don't marry the wrong person. That you treat this institution with sacredness, and, and that's the problem. God said, you, you, "The problem is you've married foreign. You've, you've married the daughters of a foreign god. They're strange to me." He says, I don't, "I don't know them, and it's a problem, and it's it's painful for the God." And then it says in verse thirteen, "I'm almost finished." That's the first thing they did. Matter of fact. Can I read the latter part of verse 12? Let me read verse 12 again. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob the man who does this, being awake and aware. May God cut you off from the blessings of God, the blessings that were sent to the line of Abraham. May they be cut off for the man who, who makes this choice and he's awake and aware. Yet, here's the problem with American church. He brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. See, we live in a culture that thinks that all you have to do is bring an offering and everything's going to be okay. Just bringing an offering can't fix the, the mess that you done created in your life. An offering doesn't move God. Now, it'll move us. If you want to bring it on here, we'll take it. But it doesn't move God. Here's verse 13. I'm almost finished. Look at verse 13. And this is the second thing you do, he says. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying. But he does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. Yet you say, for what reason? How come he doesn't accept my tears and my crying and my weeping and my fasting and my praying and my offering? Because the Lord has been a witness, verse 14, between you and the wife of your youth with whom you have dealt treacherously. 
she's your companion and your wife by covenant. Oh my God, that's profound. He says, she's your wife. You have treated her horribly, he says. This, you, you, you have treated your spouse horribly. Uh, uh, you're in a covenant. It says, she is your wife by covenant. You see, the problem in our country is we view marriage as a contract. There's a difference between a contract and a covenant. Marriage is not a contract. You are entering into a covenant relationship. It is an institution. Don't take it lightly. She's a companion. She is your companion and your wife by covenant. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? Look at this, verse 15. Why one? He seeks godly offspring. I'm trying to give y'all the heart of God here today. Y'all don't, don't have to like me. I don't care if you don't like me. You don't have to like me. You don't have to accept what I'm saying. But what I am seeking to do is to be God's mouthpiece into your ear today of what God wants to say to you. And he says, why did he make you one? Why did he allow you to get married in the first place? Why did he create the institution of marriage in the first place? It was not for your happiness. You see, you see this is the problem. We, we live in a culture that have, has promoted marriage as something uh, to make people happy. Marriage will not make you happy. Marriage, God is not interested in your happiness. Marriage is a character builder. Oh yeah, you're gonna, get, you're gonna get some character in marriage. You're gonna get some character. God's interested in your character, not your happiness. Happiness, happiness deals with external things. People get happy from external things. Happy is about building character on the inside. That's what marriage does for you. Marriage builds character on the inside. It's a character builder. So you're going you're gonna to face conflicts. When two people get together, think differently, act differently, want something different, operate in different gifts and different mindsets and all of that, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's tension. It's tension. Uh, I've been, more, I've been married to my wife for 37 years. For me to be there for 37 years. Hold on, wait, don't clap yet. Clap here. I'm ready to say something that's worthy of a clap. I, we've been, for me to stay with her for 37 years took character on somebody's part for us to stay together for 37 years. For his character. Any, any dog can leave, can leave and go find and go someplace else. Yeah, that's not, that's not a man or a woman. I'm sick of people calling me and hearing these stories of people just walking away from their marriages like it's nothing. I'm tired of it. I'm just, I feel a cussing spirit coming on me. It's not about your happiness. It's about building your character. God uses marriage to build character. I got character building me. Uh, I went to bed last night. I got in bed. My wife was watching the Hallmark Channel. <laughs> Is that what it's called, Hallmark? When you've seen one movie, you've seen them all. The names change, the faces change, but the plot remains the same. Trina Jacobs will watch the Hallmark Channel all day.
So there's a point of tension. Because I don't want to watch another Hallmark movie. I want to watch, there's a college football game on, there's, I want to, I want to watch Forensic Files. So we're, we're dialoguing about what we're going to watch. I say, I can't take another one of these movies. Girl meets boy, some conflict arises, he proposes, they get married, then they go just skipping down. <laughs> She said, I don't want to watch about nobody else getting killed and murdered. <laughs> Who's going to demonstrate character here in this situation? Thank you very much. takes character to watch the Hallmark Channel when, <laughs> when you don't want to watch the Hallmark Channel. It takes character to watch the Hallmark Channel when Clemson is playing the University of Miami for the championship. For the ACC championship, it takes character. God is interested in the building of our character. Whatever tensions you have in your marriage, it, it means somebody's character is being developed. Now you can stick to your selfishness, stick to what you want, stick to your attitude, or you can say, I'm going to let God build my character. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm doing the best that I can. And I, I ain't talking about just having the TV on. I ain't talking about me just sitting there with my... Well... I, I have tried to get into the movie. But after a while, I just, I just can't take it. <laughs> Let me roll on. Let me stick with the text. I'm, I'm trying to drive a point here today. Is, is character, marriage is a character builder. That's what I'm trying to drive home today. God wants your character built and the tensions that you have in life and particularly in marriage, is God's way of identifying the places where you need your character built. And, and here's what it says right here in verse 15. Let me, I'm going back to the text here. He says, uh, he's made you a remnant of his, he give, gave you a remnant of his spirit and made you one. And then the question is asked, uh, why, why did he make you one? And here's why. He seeks godly offspring. God, God put you in the union of marriage and what he's after is you having kids, children who you can raise up to promote his kingdom. God is interested in building his kingdom on earth. I'm almost finished. I'm coming to a close. That, that, and, and, that's, and the problem, here's the problem, here's what makes me so mad is when, when people are insistent on divorcing and ending their, their marriages and because they want to be happy and they want to go do something else and they just can't take this joker no more and they just can't take, you can't take her and you can't take him no more. We make these decisions and choices without 
consideration of the impact that this has on our children. But it is important to God. Maybe it's not important to you. Maybe you don't care. Maybe your selfishness and your, your happiness is so important that you don't care that it reaps havoc and destroys your children's ability to learn how to get along with other people. Because the, they, they never saw their parents get along. They never saw their parents sacrifice. They never saw their parents doing the right thing. So they never learned how to do the right thing. They never learned how to sacrifice. They never learned how to develop, develop character. They saw you bickering and fighting and arguing and not talking and not communicating and, and cussing each other out. And they heard your conversations on the phone woo, with what you said to your friends about your, about your husband or your, your baby daddy and, and what you said about your, 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 your baby's mamas. They, they heard the conversations that you had about their mama and daddy. Oh, y'all can't handle the truth up in here. But that's God's heart. God's heart is to raise up a generation of young people who are committed to his kingdom and know how to do it. And so God says, don't deal treacherously with the wife of your youth. Verse 16 says, for the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. Matter of fact, verse 16 says, for it covers one's garments with violence. I believe the violence in our country is because we've disregarded the family institution. Now, I know some of y'all done heard me talk about this before. I've been preaching this for 28 years. The whole time I've been here, I've been preaching it. I done lost a lot of members because of my position on this, and it's okay. One day I'll have to stand before God, and I'll tell God that I, I taught it to the best of my understanding, and I know I lost, I, lost a lot of, I lost a lot of people. It's okay. We probably could have hundreds of thousands of people, except for this position that I have. We have thousands, but we could have many more thousands of people. But it's a tough pill to swallow. What I'm trying to tell you today is what I believe is the heart of God right here from the top. And I believe the heart of God is saddened because we have ran off and gotten married to people that we didn't ask him about, didn't care what he thought about, disregarded the warnings he gave us in scripture about it, he did what we wanted to do. We've hurt his heart and we've hurt his heart because once we got married and it didn't work out the way we wanted it to work out, we just got rid of him and went on to the next relationship. I didn't expect nobody to run around. I didn't expect no dancing. There's no music celebration. Ain't nobody hooking and bucking up in the aisles here today. But I want you to think about this. I want the people who are thinking about walking away from their marriages to think about this. I want you to read the scripture about it. I want those of you who've already divorced and yet you have the opportunity to go and be restored to your spouse to think about the impact on your kids. And above all, think about the heart of God. Now, I know there's some of y'all who've, who've been divorced and your spouse have rolled on and got married elsewhere. You say, well, Pastor, what, what can I do? Well, the thing that's great about serving Jesus is that he is a God of another chance. <laughs> he has made provisions by his death on the cross for our sins to be washed away. When you put your faith in Jesus and come to him, he, he cleanses you of all your sins. Isn't that good news? He cleanses us of, of every sin that we have. You're the only one all day today, baby. Thank you very much. Give her a hand. Praise the Lord for her. Ain't nobody planting no seeds in this word but her but it's a good word. Let's stand. Let's pray. 
Humbly, Father, humbly, we come. Humbly, we acknowledge our need for you, Father. Our need for you, Lord. And I'm praying today for your people. I'm praying for the singles today as they look toward marriage. I'm praying for those who are contemplating divorce. I'm praying, Father, for those who are married, that you keep marriages strong and solid and somehow, God, give them what's needed to keep them strengthened in Jesus' name. I pray, Father, that if somebody's here today and they, they haven't been married to you, that you would draw them to you. Somebody who's unsaved, never received forgiveness of sins, draw them, Lord. They've never put their faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Draw them. Somebody in the backslidden mode, reclaim them. Somebody who's unsure, make them come to get assurance. Somebody who needs a church home, they're not planned in anywhere. Draw them now, I pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Now look at your neighbor and talk to him. Witness to your neighbor. Ask them, are they saved? Are they walking with God? Do they have a church home? I, I, and say, come on, let's get it straight. And I want to invite you to come on right now. Come. If that's you, if God's talking to you, make your way here. Come on right now. Don't put it off. Don't delay it. But come. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm so proud of you. Sad, sad, sad. Jesus at the center. From beginning to the end. Always, always been. God bless you, sweet. Proud of you. Jesus, hey. Jesus at the center. at the center of Jesus at the center of this. 